Um, welcome, everybody. Um, this is uh, Joe Panero again with our final pairs meeting. Um, tonight, we're going to be doing our case presentation. We have eight great cases to present. Um, the uh, first presenter is going to be Connor from, from uh, Thomas Jefferson. How we're going to do this evening is each presentation is going to be um, seven to eight minutes. Uh, we'll have uh, questions for, the, for one to two minutes to follow, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next presenter. If anybody has questions, just put them into the QA session. I'll ask them um, as, we're, uh, as we're going through. Um, as far as um, kind of determining a winner uh, for this thing, uh, what we're going to do is, is launch a poll during the last presentation. So I'll let everybody know when I'm launching that. Uh, everybody can put in their votes. You can only vote once. So I don't want to launch the poll uh, too soon. So we'll do that towards the end. Um, I'll have Steven wrap up um, toward, uh, at, the, at the very end to kind of go over some details for um, pairs 20, 21, 2022. Um, so with that, Connor, if you're, if you're ready to go, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. So I'm Connor. I'm one of the PGY six residents from Jefferson, and I'm presenting a case tonight of shoulder embolization, in a patient with recurrent hemarthrosis. So the case I did with Dr. Ron Winokur. So this was a 67-year-old female, history of diabetes, uh, heart failure, coronary artery disease, extensive past medical history, renal disease. She also had a type A aortic dissection that had just been managed conservatively. Um, in addition to all these comorbidities, she had been diagnosed with Milwaukee shoulder syndrome four or five years previously. Now, Milwaukee shoulder syndrome is a destructive calcium phosphate crystalline arthropathy. And in this patient, it left her with recurrent hemarthrosis in both shoulders. Her left side was more affected than the right. This had resulted in extreme shoulder pain. Uh, she could barely move either shoulder. She was essentially wheelchair bound because uh, she was unable to transfer from a seated position, unable to bear any weight uh, with either arm. So as far as treatment she had received, she was essentially being managed at this point with repeated joint aspirations. Um, sometimes they would uh, uh, inject TPA and they would usually do a steroid injection at the same time. You can see this is an ultrasound image here of her left shoulder prior to one of those aspirations. Just very thick blood products. You can imagine that it wouldn't drain very well. Uh, it did provide her with some intermittent relief, but she was continually coming back for these aspirations. She had been seen by orthopedics as, and she also followed with rheumatology. Um, she was not a surgical candidate from the ortho side and rheumatology uh, didn't have many options for her either. She was unable to tolerate oral prednisone uh, due to some of the side effects. So she actually came to us from one of the MSK musculoskeletal radiologists that had seen her repeatedly for these joint aspirations I had kind of gotten to know her and wanted to know if there was anything that we could do to help. So we had planned to attempt to embolize the, the shoulder, essentially. So in planning the case, uh, thankfully, she was a radial access candidate. Um, she did have this type A dissection. Right femoral access was a possibility if for some reason we weren't able to get straight up from the left radial. Uh, we used our typical radial access equipment, a slender five French sheath uh, with a radial cocktail of verapamil, nitroglycerin, and heparin. And then we also used a 2.4 French prograte and a, a 016 fathom for the selective catheterization. So our plan going into this study was to do arteriography and, and uh, see the vessels that were hypervascular or demonstrated a blush around the, the left glenohumeral joint, and then try to selectively catheterize those vessels and perform the embolization. We used a technique similar to geniculate artery embolization that's been described. We used uh, 100 to 300 micrometer embospheres in very small aliquots of 0.3 milliliters. We would inject the embospheres 
clear and then perform a DSA after each aliquot. And our goal was not for stasis, but more just to uh, see that blush around the glenohumeral joint decrease. So this is just some anatomy because I definitely had to pull out the oofflockers um, prior to this case. But just as a review, this is our catheter in the axillary artery, uh, the thoracoacromial trunk, lateral thoracic artery, subscapular artery, and the uh, posterior circumflex humeral artery coming out laterally. This is the more delayed images from that run in the axillary artery. You can see around the glenohumeral joint and the proximal humerus, there's that area of hyperemia or, or blush uh, that we were trying to embolize. So I have some images here. Uh, some, of, some of the findings are a little bit more subtle, but we selectively catheterized multiple different vessels and tried to identify the vessels that were primarily responsible for that hyperemic tissue. It ended up being pr predominantly, we have our microcatheter in the uh, thoric thoracoacromial artery here. And the image on the left is the, the pre-image um, with this hyperemia and uh, hypervascular tissue around the proximal humerus. And then the image on the right is post-embolization uh, where you see a, a decrease in that, in that hypervascularity. This is the second artery that we embolized. We, we interrogated multiple arteries, but, but these were the two that we felt like contributed the most uh, to, the, to the proximal humerus uh, hyperemia. So here we're in the posterior circumflex humeral artery. And again, image on the left, there's this area with hyperemia and hypervascularity and post embolization. We don't, we don't see that. It really didn't take very much to embolize these vessels. Um, I, I think we used a total of two milliliters of embospheres. So I, I think one of the most exciting things about this is that at three months, she did very well. She had marked improvement in her left shoulder pain, no swelling. Uh, she has not been back for aspiration of her left shoulder, though her right shoulder has been aspirated twice. And she's in interested in us doing her right shoulder as well as both geniculate arteries for her chronic knee pain. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, Connor. The um, uh, what size particles did you guys end up using? We used one hundred to three hundred. Okay. And then, did you have any um, uh, like skin modeling or or just like like any skin changes? I know sometimes that can happen when you do geniculate artery embos. No, we we didn't see any of that. Uh, but, you know, and that was one thing that we were concerned about when we were embolizing to try to go to try to go light, um, but we didn't end up seeing anything afterwards. Okay. Um, all right, great. Thanks, Connor. Um, let's, uh, let's move on to our next presentation. Uh, Matt, you're up next. Uh, Matt's coming from uh, University of Washington. Welcome, Matt. Hello there, thank you guys for having me. I'm just getting this set up right now. Uh, so for my case, I'll be presenting a ruptured portal vein and biliary anastomotic dehiscence coming to IR and uh, how we chose to manage this. Uh, my attendings for this case were David Shin and Jeff Chick. Uh, the little background about this patient is that he's a 67-year-old man who had multiple prior liver transplants. His most recent one was complicated by post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. Uh, he was admitted to the hospital for worsening failure, concerning for rejection, and even worsening biliary obstruction. He initially went to GI, to, where he underwent an ERCP, which showed anastomo anastomotic dehiscence. And after they saw this on ERCP, they got additional imaging and consulted us for 
what we can do to help this patient. And uh, a little bit of this will play in as we go forward. So just to show you the ERCP, uh, his anatomy at the hepatogogeginostomy in estenosis was unable to be traversed with the scope. Uh, what they saw was a, a breakdown essentially there and could not, did not even attempt to try to go further through that for risk of injury. And one of the things that they got on their initial evaluation was an ultrasound. So uh, on the screen right, you can see that there's a three centimeter uh, ovoid lesion adjacent to the main portal vein. And then on the screen left, what we have is our color Doppler evaluation of this, and they saw to and fro flow within this structure. Now on CT, after they had consulted us, we asked them to get a multi-phase CT to assess this area. So uh, I've given you three axial images here, um, going uh, superior to inferior. Uh, on the far left, the blue arrow is pointing to this low density area with some foci of air. So this was after the ERCP, this is actually the area of PTLD and uh, presumably the errors from their recent ERCP. And even on that slice, you can again, you start to see that oval lesion there that's the same density as our portal vein. Now on the images in the middle and to the right, uh, the green arrow is uh, focusing on that uh, vascular structure. As you can see, it's in continuity with the portal vein in these images and lining up at the same time. Now putting it together, uh, what we believe has happened here is that this area of PTLD, which is essentially uh, proliferation of lymph lymphocyte cells here is eroding into the biliary anastomoses. And we probably have a combination of a biliary leak as well as a local invasion that led to the breakdown and, and a contained rupture of the portal vein. Uh, now, the thing that kind of threw us off here as well was that uh, those images were on the arterial phase. So one of the things we were worried about was whether or not there was some erosion into uh, an arterial structure that gave rise to a fistula also causing this problem. So moving forward, our plan was to approach uh, all the systems that we could for this patient. The first one is to assess the arterial supply, make sure that there was no fistulous connection. Second, we wanted to access uh, the portal vein and do a stent assisted coiling of this uh, contained rupture because uh, we were concerned that as this continues to progress and since they haven't been able to get this under control, uh, this would eventually uh, no longer be contained and could be catastrophic for the patient. And then the third, uh, just as he came for the ERCP and had the uh, dehiscence, we needed to uh, effectively provide drainage for his biliary system. Now, for part one uh, of the arterial access, we, we arterial evaluation, we got a standard right confirmed artery access with a four French sheath, got up with the C2. He actually has a... Uh, uh, origin of the transplant hepatic artery anastomosis with the regular hepatic artery uh, as a separate origin from the celiac access. So what I'm showing you here is actually two images of when we injected uh, that transplant hepatic artery. And you can see there's just abrupt occlusion, uh, no further uh, portions of the arterial system lit up on that injection. So uh, but this effectively ruled out the possible possibility of the fistula and probably explained some of this ischemic cholangiopathy that we're getting improbable um, poor blood supply to the biliary tree leading to his dehiscence as well. Um, part two was the portal vein evaluation. So here we got transplantic portal vein access. We did this with a 21 gauge tube and needle and AccuStick set. Uh, so the image on the left shows that uh, our wire into the portal vein system. And after we got our access there, what we did was switch out to a six French vascular sheath and we placed a pigtail into the portal vein. And here's the run just to give you a better idea. Uh, here you can see a peristentesis strain that we also place at the same time to uh, take off the fluid from the patient. But what you're seeing here is uh, opacification of the biliary system. I'll play it one more time here. There's a narrowing of the portal vein here, likely from their anastomosis, and this outpouching uh, in the middle of the image, uh, which is uh, that contained rupture. So now what we did was set up for our stent assisted coiling. From the transplantic access, we got our four French Cobra through. Then we put in our 2.8 prograde into that sac. Um, here you can see multiple projections between the first image and the second image on the screen, uh, showing how it forms that uh, looped appearance, uh, which correlates with what we've seen on our venography. Um, next, what we did was we got uh, access of the left groin, got in a 12 French sheath, got in the ice, uh, ice catheter, which is for intracardiac echo, echocardiography, which we often use a lot for our tips here. 
Um, we use that to guide um, access through the hepatic vein into the portal vein with a Rosh Hashida set. Uh, so that's what you're seeing in the middle image. You're seeing um, uh, the cannula and the wire uh, entering the portal vein. And then on the far right of the slide, what you're seeing is now uh, our through access from the um, left internal jugular vein through the hepatic vein into the portal vein with the wire uh, paralleling our vascular sheath in the splenic vein. And now what we did is we put a pigtail through um, here, and this is to help us plan. But as you can see, our, our plan is to stent the, that portal vein to exclude that uh, contained rupture while also giving us still the room to uh, coil that uh, contained rupture to make sure that we've effectively treated it. Uh, so what we use here was an 11 by 59 millimeter VBX stent graft, uh, stent graft to uh, make sure we got a good exclusion of that sac. And so the far image on the left is our initial uh, placement. And then here you have our uh, uh, dilation of the stent with the balloon. And then on our far image here, you have our stent placement in its relation to that sac. And now what we moved on to do, we then moved back to our splenic access, injected our microcatheter, proved that we were getting good, fairly good stasis already of that sac. And I know that the angles are very difficult to continue to show you, but uh, it was being excluded by that stent. And from there, what we did was we introduced our pod coils here until we got sufficient packing of the, the lesion. And then on the far right, what we've done for uh, closure of our access is we do an eight millimeter amp amplatzer plug deployment to uh, which is guided by both fluoro and uh, ultrasound to make sure that we have a closure of our track. Here's one more sine here, uh, again from our splenic access, showing uh, that we have a good um, coiling and embolization of this sac. It's no longer filling uh, as we are injecting from that splenic vein access. But of course, we're not done yet. As, we, as the patient initially came for that biliary obstruction, what we then had to do was, uh, was to place internal external biliary drains to allow for drainage of this patient. Now, uh, as many of you guys are probably aware of with these transplant livers, they're not necessarily dilated because of the fibrosis in the liver. And so we were hoping that with one access, we may see both uh, biliary limbs here, but unfortunately, even with our first stick on the left, which is uh, the far image on the left, uh, you don't see a pacification of the right side of the, of the biliary tree. And, uh, but what we were able to do was to negotiate the biliary dehiscence um, and get through. It didn't quite fall into a nice channel like we've seen with um, other biliary drain placements, but we were able to get through into the bowel and to pacify it, which is what you're seeing there with the contrast in the bowel. We then went to the right side, again, a lateral approach, uh, got in with our 21 gauge needle, we're starting to show pacification here, and switched out for acu our uh, Aggie stick set, and we're able to get good opacification here as well. And then we then change that out for a 10 French biliary drain as well. So in conclusion, uh, what I've, I've come to call like a trinity of, of uh, hepatic cases here is that we've looked at the arterial system to rule out any fishless connection. We were able to do portal vein stem assisted coiling, as well as uh, providing internal external biliary drainage for this patient. Uh, this patient was then able to have relief of his biliary obstruction. He was relisted for transplant. He was able to leave the hospital. And I just say thank you for letting me be here and present. Uh, thank you for my attendings uh, working with us on this case and my co-resident, Arthi, who was also present during this, this long case and our, our wonderful staff here. And that's my dog. Thanks, man. That was great. Um, I had a, a couple questions. Um, was, and maybe you mentioned this in there, were, given that the patient had kind of this bio leak, um, were they bacteremic at all? Or did you, uh, I'm just wondering from an antibiotic uh, prophylactic standpoint, you know, putting a stent graft in a vascular structure with somebody who's kind of got all this stuff going on, was infection a concern for you guys? So uh, for us, we, he wasn't bacteremic at the time, but we did cover empirically with um, ceftriaxone and metronidazole as we do for most of our biliary drain placements. Um, uh, we spoke to GI about it as well, who they didn't feel that it was necessarily an infection as much as it was just er erosion invasion here. 
Okay. And then was there talk at all? Because I know the the 11 by 59 VVX is you can over dilate them, right? You can take that up to 16. Was there ever talk or did you guys think of flaring the um, like kind of the, the, the one the side that's more on the portal side at all to, uh, to get any to get any better apposition or did that not really come up or? Um, I, I think we discussed a lot of the different sizes for that area. I think um, we could have gone larger, uh, but we felt that this was an appropriate size. We have dilated up to 16 in other cases. Um, and I think what's kind of also in there, I'm trying to get to that slide, but um, uh, he, he did have some narrowing of the portal vein that already existed from the transplant, the portal vein anastomosis, and it felt like it wasn't moving and we didn't have any problems with the size there. Got it, okay. Okay, um, and then um, how did the patient do, I guess, the subsequent like weeks to months? Because obviously the, the arterial inflow was still kind of trash. Mm -hmm. So did the patient end up get, developing like biomas or anything like that? Or did they actually get a transplant fairly quickly or how did it go? So um, he, after he left, uh, his actually the, on the following days after the procedure, his uh, bilirubin levels uh, started to uh, downtrend. So almost immediately after the day after his, his labs were all improving. Um, unfortunately, he's not able to get a transplant quickly. And I've, uh, on recent follow-up on him, he's transitioned to comfort care. But uh, the last time I spoke to him, he was just happy to uh, be able to not be in the hospital. His hospital stay was actually fairly a uh, couple weeks long. So I think the important thing for him was to be able to go home and not be uh, stuck, in, stuck in the hospital. Okay, um, I'm being told I'm asking too many questions, so we'll stop there. Um, th thanks, Matt, appreciate it. Um, okay, next um, we have a presentation um, coming from India. Uh, Vimal, if you're there, you should be able to share your screen um, and then just make, your, just make sure you're unmuted. Hello. Hello. We can hear you. Uh, are you able to see my screen? No, we can see your screen. I'll go ahead. Then. Um, if you could speak up a little bit, it's a little hard hard to hear. Uh, is is this better? Yep, that's better. Okay, so I'll go ahead. So good evening and greetings from India. I am Dr. Vimal Chako, uh, Vimal Chako Mondi, a resident in. The Department of Imaging Sciences and Interventional Radiology, Shrishitra Tirunal Institute for Medical Sciences and Technology, Trandum, India. And my consultants on this case were Dr. Janish and Dr. Anu. So I'll be presenting a case of rare cause of hemoptysis and its endovascular management. So going into the case, this was a 16-year-old male patient with a history of low-grade fever and significant weight loss for the past one month. He presented to the emergency department with an episode of massive hemoptysis with an expectation of approximately 300 to 400 ml of blood. So at presentation, he was in shock with a blood pressure of 80 over 50 and tachycardia. And his hemoglobin was also uh, very low, 6.4. He was resuscitated with IV fluids and RB, uh, transfusions, and after which his condition stabilized. All his other routine blood parameters were normal, except for an elevated ESR of 75. An IR consultation was done for possible endovascular management. So we proceeded with a multiphasic contrast enhanced uh, chest, CT chest. So these were the findings. Uh, you can see that there are areas of consolidation as well as ground glass opacities in the anterior as well as lingular segments of the left upper lobe, small patchy areas of consolidation in the superior segment of the left lower lobe as well. Uh, also, you can see in on the right image that there is a small, uh, well-defined fluid filled cavity in the anterior segment of the left upper lobe. Again, there were also enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes in the prevascular space with peripheral enhancement suggesting a central necrosis. In the pulmonary arteries were normal, but the angiographic phase of the CT revealed hypertrophied prominent bronchial artery supplying these disease segments, as well as a non-bronchial systemic collateral arising from the left subclavian artery, the branch of the left internal mammary artery. And this left bronchial as well as the branch from the left internal mammary was supplying these disease segments of the left upper lobe. And this on the far 
right, you can see the axial section. You can see there are lots of tortuous vessels uh, uh, giving the appearance of some form of uh, underlying bronchopulmonary or arteriovenous shunting going on in these disease segments. So uh, the CT revealed that these were the sources, were likely sources of the hemoptysis. So we went ahead with planning for embolization of these, uh, these abnormal vessels. And so we were shifted to the cath lab and under local anesthesia through the right common uh, femoral artery axis, the right, uh, the left subclavian was selectively cannulated, followed by uh, cannulation of the left internal mammary artery. This is the angio run, which showed of the left internal mammary artery using a microcatheter. You can see that there is abnormal uh, vascular blush in the region of the left upper lobe. Or the, another thing that is prominent is this shunting from the bronchial artery into the upper branch of the left pulmonary artery, which is seen here. So we went ahead with embolization of the uh, left internal mammary uh, artery. Uh, so this was done with uh, three uh, coils, Cook Nestor coils. And this is the, uh, on the right is the post embolization image. Uh, on comparison with the pre embolization image, you can see that there is significant reduction of the vascular blush with satisfactory stasis. Then we went ahead with embolization of the le abnormal left hypertrophied bronchial. So again, this was again uh, cannulated and then selectively, uh, selectively with a microcatheter. And uh, post uh, this was embolized with PVA particles, uh, 300 to 500. And the post embolization images showing uh, significant reduction of the vascular blush with satisfactory stasis. So after this procedure, this patient was uh, late, uh, was stable, and his the remainder of his uh, of his hospital stay, he had no further episodes of hemoptysis. Since the clinic clinical as well as lab and imaging parameters were suggestive of tuberculosis as a possible etiology, we had sent a sputum AFB as well as culture, which turned out positive for the acid fast bacilli as well as the cultures grew mycobacterium tuberculosis, and so he was subsequently started on anti tuberculous therapy. However, unfortunately for this patient, two weeks later, he had another bout of massive hemoptysis and presented to our emergency department again. So we did a repeat CT pulmonary uh, CT, multi basic CT for uh, looking for the cause of this failed uh, embolization and repeat uh, cause for the hemoptysis. So these were the uh, axial and oblique coronal uh, MIP images from the second CT. You can see that there is a pseudo aneurysm arising from the segmental branch of the left pulmonary artery supplying the anterior segment. This is very close to the cavity which we saw in the previous uh, CT. So these imaging characteristics uh, ca features were characteristic of a Rasmussen aneurysm, which is a, a, a in infective inflammatory pseudo aneurysm of a pulmonary artery in the setting of a in the setting of tuberculosis close to or within a tubercular tuberculous cavity. So uh, this was thought to be the likely source of the repeat uh, hemoptysis, and we went ahead with the plan of embolizing uh, this uh, pseudo aneurysm. So again, he was shifted to the cath lab through the right common femoral vein approach. Uh, the main pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery were cannulated using uh, pigtail catheters. Uh, angiograms of these vessels, the main pulmonary and the left pulmonary didn't reveal the uh, pseudo aneurysm. However, then we went ahead with selective cannulation of the segmental branch of the uh, left pulmonary artery. And this showed the filling of this aneurysmal sac with contrast. Uh, as is seen in these uh, angio runs. And subsequently, this the segmental branch supplying this pseudo aneurysm was coiled with around uh, three to four coils, uh, cook and coils. And these, this is the post embolization angiogram showing exclusion of this aneurysm with no residual filling of the aneurysmal sac. After the second procedure, he again had no further episodes of hemoptysis in the remainder of his hospital stay. There was no further drop in hemoglobin. He was discharged with the advice to continue and complete his anti tubercular therapy and is currently on follow up. He's doing well at four months. So uh, just a few learning points from this patients, even in the case of tuberculosis, the bronchial arteries is the most common source of hemoptysis. However, other sources like pulmonary arteries, and in this case, uh, Rasmussen aneurysms have to be thought of, especially when patient presents with a hemoptysis after uh, the embolization of the bronchial arteries and other non-systemic, non-bronchial systemic collaterals. So these uh, pseudoaneurysms have been classified by Shin et al. And according to his classification, this was a type B because the aneurysm was seen only on selective cannulation of the uh, segmental pulmonary artery. And according to him, uh, this requires successive embolization of bronchial and non-bronchial systemic collaterals, as well as the feeding 
branch of the pulmonary artery which is which was done in this case Be this is especially so because there exist uh, prominent significant bronchopulmonary shunts which uh, due to which the aneurysm could be fed by both the bronchioles as well as the pulmonary arteries so if all fails the other methods available are percutaneous injection using thrombin or glue and finally if uh, none of the endovascular approaches work surgical resection of the involved segment so that is it uh, thank you Thanks, Fimo. Um, that was great. The, the, um, uh, and again, if anybody has any questions, please put them in the, the Q&A section. Um, uh, we can go over them. The well, one question I had, because you saw a bronchial artery to, to pulmonary artery fistula, um, and you guys used particles. Did, was there any concern as far as, uh, and I think you said three to fives, uh, was there any concern as far as having any of those particles uh, cross over into the, the pulmonary circulation um you know causing like a like a pulmonary infarct or anything like that uh yeah i, I forgot to mention that uh it just before the embolization we used a few gel foam pledges so to so as to block off those chunks and that was followed by the particles so that's okay what we per did first. perfect no, how commonly great. real quick another question is how commonly you know over here we do a lot of bronchial artery embolizations for cystic fibrosis patients but i would imagine over there that's it's more commonly for tuberculosis, or how commonly do you see this problem of massive hemoptysis from TB? Yeah, yeah TB is the, uh, like, it's the first, we say it's the first, second, and third most common cause, because more, almost 95% will be from tuberculosis or it's equally. Uh, so, yeah, most of the cases is from tuberculosis. But even in those cases, this pulmonary artery as a cause of the hemoptysis is quite rare. Even in those cases of tuberculosis, it's mostly from the bronchioles. Um, okay. Um, next up, um, again, thank, thanks a lot. Uh, again, Vimal, uh, good to have you in this discussion. Uh, next, um, Sean, uh, if you're ready to go, uh, you're up. All right. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. <clears throat> Can you see the main presentation screen? Because I want to make sure I have two screens up. OK. So uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sean. I'm a PGY6 resident at Jefferson, along with Dr. McKee. Uh, so today, I'll be going over a case of uh, sharp recanalization in uh, central venous occlusion, uh, particularly in the innominate vein. So uh, this patient came to us uh, from an outside hospital. He was 27 years old. Um, he had a pertinent past medical history of congenital multicystic dysplastic kidney, which required bilateral nephrectomies um, and obviously lifelong dialysis access, which included innumerable hemodialysis catheters. Uh, at the point when he saw him, he had come from an attempt of recanalizing from through the left because he currently had a left upper extremity arterial venous brachiocephalic fistula, uh, which was working suboptimally and causing waxing and waning, <clears throat> was resulting in waxing and waning uh, facial edema and uh, collateralization, which we saw only when he got here. Uh, so basically, the, that's what the next bullet kind of uh, details. But uh, uh, in the next picture, you're going to see pretty dramatic uh, collateralization along his superficial neck veins, uh, which uh, pretty much extended across his entire body wall and down to his, his uh, groin uh, in order to get uh, drainage through the IVC. So uh, before the procedure, uh, we wanted to get some planning going. We couldn't give him contrast uh, because uh, he couldn't actually get a successful dialysis through his fistula. It was working just enough to take fluid off so his shortness of breath would be abated. Uh, and uh, so we got a CT, uh, a non-con CT of the chest. So in front of you on the top and the bottom, you see uh, you know, the right brachiocephalic and left brachiocephalic uh, veins leading into the SVC. Um, what's striking about this CT is uh, the linear calcifications uh, coursing through the right brachiocephalic and the nominant veins, uh, which is, you know, pretty disheartening for someone who's trying to recanalize uh, central veins above the diaphragm, uh, 
pointing to probably long-standing fibrin sheets and calcified fibrin sheets with probable venous contracture uh, leading to the SVC. <clears throat> You'll also notice that he actually has a short segment stent at the central anominate vein, which ends at the superior vena cava confluence. So <clears throat> going into this case, obviously, uh, Dr. Winnaker, uh, who was my attending during the procedure, was planning uh, the high likelihood of a sharp recanalization. Now for us, uh, nowadays, everybody is, is very keen on uh, gaining bilateral recanalization from the upper extremities uh, in order to mimic physiologic venous flow and hopefully get rid of collateralization. Uh, but in this case, we knew it was gonna be a, a Herculean task to at least get one vein open. And since he had the arterial venous fistula access on his left side, we were gonna attempt a recanalization of the left. So the first step in the procedure after we got sheath access in the left upper extremity and uh, left groin was to establish exactly where the occlusion began, where the occlusion ended, as we didn't have contrast to help us on the CT venogram. So the first image is two overlaid uh, stills from the digital subtraction venography from the left upper extremity, as you can see here, and then the right lower extremity, as you can see here with catheter tips in both the central anominant and uh, peripheral anominant at the sort of jugular venous area. And uh, this is a picture of without fluoro to kind of give you a sense of the distance with and without contrast of exactly how long the occlusion was that we were going to have to traverse. So to begin with, uh, we knew it was gonna be uh, you know, troublesome to try and get across the occlusion with, with, without a, a sharp method, but we had to give it the old college try to cross with the glide wire, uh, and which we did from both below and above. And this was ultimately unsuccessful. Uh, so then we started escalating our attempts uh, by using sharp recanalization techniques. So just, just to give you a kind of a, a, an equipment overview, we have two 10 French, well, this is a 12 French and this is a, uh, excuse me, six, six French long sheath uh, to the sides of the occlusion. We have two Navacross uh, braided hydrophilic catheters at either end of the occlusion and we're trying to penetrate with a stiff glide wire. The first sharp recanalization attempt we made was from the groin using the back end of uh, both an extra stiff, super, excuse me, super stiff Amplatz wire and Lunderquist wire. Uh, so basically what we would do is get sheath access all the way up through the stent in the SVC right here and use the back end of the wire to try to jab into a gooseneck snare uh, which was coming from the left upper extremity. Now, as the, as the floral grab shows, the linear trajectory from this angle looks spot on going through the, the lasso. And after multiple passes with results ending like that in the AP projection, uh, we decided that this technique probably was not gonna work given the fact that the contract, the cicatrization and scarring around the fibrin sheaths was really just uh, deflecting our back end of our wire. Um, you know, we kind of talked about the utility of an RF wire at this point, which we, we, which we didn't have at our disposal. So sort of the next step would be a actual, an actual needle to traverse that. So whether it be a Chiba needle or a uh, Rosha Sheeta needle. In this case, uh, Dr. Winnaker likes to use a technique with a uh, transjugular liver biopsy metal cannula uh, because that gives us some steerability. So we actually went from the upper extremity access, we upsized it so we could, get, so we could accommodate the, the cannula. And this would hopefully offer us some rotational um, aiming to get into the actual central portion of the uh, patent lumen. And that was ultimately unsuccessful as well. The Chiba needle kept uh, being sliding uh, superior and un unfortunately posterior to the vein, which as we know, there are some pretty important structures right behind the anomalous vein. Sorry about that. Uh, so, we're running it. We're, this is probably around six hours into the case, and you know we're, we we've made, you know, more than more than passes than you know that might have been safe. So we were about to um, kind of just back off and and sort of regroup uh, when we we put the ultrasound probe up on the uh, the supraclavicular fossa and noted noticed that 
uh, we could visualize both the peripheral and central ends of the occlusion of the of the patent vein. Uh, so we had the idea of actually um, doing a, a access from an extra anatomic approach. So the ultrasound images that we saved during the procedure really would not do it justice. So I kind of made a little bit of a graphic here. Sorry for the cheesy animation. But basically, here is a schematic of this gentleman's occlusions. The red uh, sweet spray paint over color uh, identifies the occlusion, the right brachiocephalic vein, and the short segment occlusion that we were trying to cross. And the gray uh, coloring represents the stent that he already had. So our goal here was to establish an ultrasound window visualizing both ends of the occlusion. Um, and obviously, at, at this point, it's very, very important to make sure that we re recognize the anterior posterior anterior posterior relationship of the great vessels and the, of the aortic arch and the actual nominate vein. We actually took a, so from that point, we used a, a 20, 22 gauge in-rad needle, which is a, a laser etched needle tip, which shows up extremely echogenic on ultrasound, especially for uh, deep accesses and, and accesses that are just difficult to see. And we were able to sort of drive the needle through the proximal, excuse me, the peripheral portion of the occlusion across the occlusion itself and then into the central portion of the patent vein. Now, when we, when our needle tip got more central or deeper in the ultrasound image, it was very, very hard to reconcile which lumen we were actually looking at, whether it was the, you know, the, the left sided great vessels, uh, the great arteries or the vein. So because we couldn't finish the pass success, uh, confidently with ultrasound, we decided to switch over to fluoro. And uh, as we all know, that the, the, there's a you know, pretty commonly used technique in multiple parts of the body for uh, balloon targeting uh, with uh, fluoro fluoroscopic guidance of, of the needle. And here you can see the needle reaches the balloon. Unfortunately, we don't get the, the cool popping uh, fluoroscopy video, but uh, we were actually able to sneak the, uh, the, the wire through the in-rad needle beyond the, beyond the balloon, through the stent, and into the IVC. So that bring, uh, brings us to the conclusion of the technically challenging portion of the procedure. And, and the, the more cerebral portion of the procedure is kind of how do we get this access from outside the body to completely endovascular? So our first step was to confirm that we had safe access across the occlusion. And by doing that, we performed, we, we advanced a Greb set, which is an AccuStick type catheter uh, that actually has, is a little bit longer. It's five French and it accommodates an 035 wire. Uh, we put it across the occlusion and pu did pullback tractography to prove that we were both in the central patent lumen across the occlusion without being in an artery and then in the peripheral portion of the, of, the, of the patent lumen. So this provided us proof that we didn't cross an artery and we were in both sides of the occlusion. The second part of the uh, process was to establish a monorail, which was to get a through and through access from the left upper extremity to the left groin. Uh, and by doing this, in doing this, we upsized the Greb set, which was that, that AccuStick sort of uh, step up catheter uh, to a five French sheath which, was, which allowed us to put a side-by-side 0.035-inch -side AMP plats into the IVC for safety access. If the next step were to be unsuccessful, we would still have access. So through and through access with a 035 stiff glide wire and a AMP plats safety wire in the IVC. From the groin, we passed the Navacross catheter, as you can see here, up towards the shoulder uh, to the extra anatomic access. And with gentle withdrawal, we were pro we probed with the glide wire until we hooked into the peripheral portion of the lumen and were able to snare the, the glide wire to arm and groin access. And after we had that access through and through, we did uh, you know, IVIS to measure the occlusive segment. We did pre-angioplasty, pre, uh, excuse me, venoplasty to make room for the stent and then deployed a, a 14 millimeter by 12 centimeter operate. Uh, Medtronic Abre stent. So after the after this uh, deployment, where we ended in the KYHO junction, uh, we performed the final uh, venography, which showed. I don't know why it's not working here. There we go, which showed a patent lumen of the innominate vein, uh, good good uh, inflow into the right atrium, 
And then obviously, as you can see here, this is immediately post-op in the PACU, uh, some puncture holes from you know trying to change different angles for the needle. But the, the, the point is the collateralization uh, had pretty much vanished at the end of the procedure. Additionally, his facial swelling improved tremendously, which he endorsed, but I wasn't sure what the, uh, the, the rules were on putting facial pictures on the presentation, so I left it out. Um, that's a great case. Um, we do have a, a question from the audience. Um, when doing a sharp brachycephalic recan, do you routinely have a pericardiocentesis tray available um, in the room as pericardial reflections often rise above the level of the SVC splash and omnit junction? Uh, yeah. Yeah, actually, in this case, we, we, had, um, we had the sub xiphoid region prepped in. Uh, we had a drain ready in case we needed to put it in. However, uh, you know, fortunately, but not, but unfortunately for this guy, he had suffered a really bad trauma when he was younger and already had a pericardial window set up. Um, so he would have had some outlet. Um, we don't know how much outlet he would have had, but in this case, we typically like to have a cardiac anesthesia available as well as have the tools for a, a pericardial synthesis or a drain placement. Okay. And then, um, I'm not sure if, if you guys, if you and Ron kind of talked, talked through it or not, if you didn't see that with ultrasound, did, what would your next step event? So honestly, it, 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 it came down to whether or not we were willing to try something more, you know, heroic. And there was no, there was no idea that, that at least, you know, Dr. Winokur and I were, you know, were discussing it. And I think he was after using the Chiba needle with the transjugular metal cannula, and not having a, a confident, like, let me try it again, I'm close, uh, you know, feeling. I think he was considering uh, backing off from the procedure, at least for the day, to kind of regroup and, and plan to see if there was another approach that we could take. Uh, we tried to put the metal cannula through the groin access, but it was just not long enough to get to the, uh, to the central portion of the patent lumen. Um, but I guess the short answer is really there was no other step that we had in mind. That was, that was the maximum that we had reached. Yeah. Until we put the ultrasound on there. Okay. All right. Great. Um, thanks again. Um, moving moving on to the next case, uh, Tamara, you're up next. Um, screen is yours. Okay. All right. So, um, hi everybody. I'm Tamara Baum. I am from Temple. Um, I can't take credit for any of this case because I wasn't actually involved in it. It was done before my time in IR at Temple. Um, Dr. Panero actually was um, the attending physician on it, and Dr. Dan Dakotis was the resident at the time, who's now an attending at Cooper. Um, okay, so patient AR. Um, so this is a 61 year old male. He presented to the hepatology clinic. His family had been reporting lethargy and bloody diarrhea for the previous two days. Um, he had a past medical history that was significant for uh, hepatitis C. He had alcohol uh, abuse as well, and he had a history of cirrhosis. Um, he had also undergone a, in his previous, uh, like pr about nine years prior, a partial small bowel resection after um, he had been diagnosed with a small bowel obstruction. He had an ileal uh, resection and, and um, anastomosis. Um, so the hematologist, uh, the hepatologist actually decided to send him to the emergency room for further evaluation. So the, for reasons that are unclear to me, he had a CT chest as his first imaging. Um, it demonstrated significant dilatation of the portal veins and then the tributary branches. Uh, it was recommended to get further dedicated abdominal imaging. So he actually ended up having an abdominal ultrasound. Um, so on the ultrasound imaging, as you can see here, the SMV was markedly dilated. Um, you can see it adjacent to the aorta on the transverse imaging. And then on the sagittal imaging, you can actually see it measured, um, I think 11 millimeters uh, at its largest point. And then there was a 0.9 centimeter direct communication, which you can also see in that transverse imaging between the superior mesenteric artery and the superior mesenteric vein um, with significant dilatation of the SMV as I've shown. There was also pulsatile arterial flow um, within the superior mesenteric vein as shown in this imaging here with the sagittal SMV uh, with this arterial Doppler imaging. 
So the following day, the patient, um, so he was admitted and then IR was consulted and then they he proceeded to the angio suite the following day for further angiographic evaluation and possible intervention. Um, so this was his initial imaging. So he had arteriography of the celiac axis, the superior mesenteric artery and the inferior mesenteric inferior mesenteric artery. Um, everything else was included just for, and the IMA was included for complete mistake as overnight he had had further bloody uh, stools. So access was obtained, right common, femoral. Um, the SMA was selectively catheterized with 11 catheter, and then it was advanced into the mid to distal SMA over a Benson wire. Um, the 11 catheter was then exchanged over a Rosen for a five French comfy catheter, and then the sheath was advanced into the, um, the mid SMA. You can actually see how markedly dilated the, um, the SMV is here on the uh, arteriography. Through the comfy catheter, um, an eight millimeter APV4 plug, which is shown here, um, was deployed in the distal SMA, just proximal to the SMA, SMV fistula that you could, that you could see in the, in the imaging previously. Um, you can, this is the imaging right before the contrast injection where you can actually see the, the amplasser plug. And then this was the post embolization imaging, um, which showed the, um, the SMA now, um, no longer having a fistulous communication. And then this is a delayed image as well. Again, um, all of the SMA branches are filling, but there is no longer that fistula into the SMV. Um, so the MRI, the patient then underwent an MRI three days later, just for further evaluation while he was still an inpatient. Um, and at, at the, so, what's my notes for this? Um, this actually demonstrated thrombosis of the SMV that was from the level of the fistula to the level of the portal confluence, which you can see here in this axial image. And then um, this kernel image actually shows it really well. Um, luckily, the patient didn't have any significant clinical sequelae from this, but uh, this does show that, that thrombosis that he had. And then this was um, a CT that was done the following day, which again showed um, the development of the clot within the SMV. Um, there was also some clot within the IMA, uh, sorry, the IMV, but again, there was no clinical significance from it. Patient had um, his most recent imaging in our system is from 2018. He is currently being treated for esophageal cancer, and this shows the implants plug here. Um, and the SMA is now you know, kind of collapsed around it, but still, um, you know, no further uh, fistula communication. So, and then here's uh, another closer up image of, of that, right proximal to the implants plug, implants are plug. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, Tamara. Did the patient um, get anticoagulated after? Did he keep the patient on anticoagulation, Joe? Or? So we had that discussion, and because he came in with a lower GI bleed, they didn't want to do it. I kind of told him that, look, he's going to have pretty pretty slow flow through that huge SMV, and there's a good chance he'll, he'll thrombose off it partially. And because of his bleeding and needing resuscitated and everything, they did not want to anticoagulate him. So the interesting part is he actually did end up getting anticoagulation long term, and the clot basically went away over time. His portal vein stayed fine; he didn't progress thrombosis wise. Studies resolved; um, everything um, kind of got better. But the presumption was that when they did the bowel resection and they used, I, I forget what those staples uh, clamp uh, devices are, that basically they just stapled the SMV and SMA together, and the patient then developed, uh, you know, fistula from that. But, uh, but yeah, no, it was discussed. I kind of lost the, uh, the battle when uh, the patient was not anticoagulated post-procedure. Um, okay, thanks a lot, Tamara. Um, our next presenter is going to be uh, Will Casper. Um, Will, you should be able to, uh, to share your screen. Um, how's it going, man? Um, the, uh, I think you're presenting a case on IVC uh, thrombectomy. Uh, you can go ahead whenever you're ready. Cool. All right. Hey, you guys. Um, all right. Sorry about that. Okay, all right. 
So uh, I'm interested, I'm uh, presenting a case, uh, it's, it's a case that Dr. Prachit Patel did. Um, Paul Nava works on the slides. He's actually uh, out on uh, vacation right now, so I'm just presenting the slides for him. Um, but our case, um, let me just give this away. So it's a 39 year old female. She just has a past one history of uh, asthma, morbid obesity, prior C section, as well as uh, iron deficiency anemia. She presented to the Temple ED in March of this year, presenting with abdominal pain, uh, questionable melanin and dark stools, uh, as well as uh, heavy meses. Um, in the ED, she had a uh, lab done. Her hemoglobin was found to be 4.1. Her BMP was found to be normal. Her white count was fine, as well as her platelet count. She had a concurrent uh, CT asthma pelvis done at that time, which showed a free floating uh, infrarenal cable thrombus extending into the right common iliac vein, as well as the left common iliac vein. Also on the scan itself, it showed uh, questionable compression of the uh, left common iliac vein via the right common iliac artery, considering for May Turner syndrome. Uh, also, incidentally, she was found to have a uh, like a, a uterine fibroid measuring approximately uh, three, I believe, three millimeter, uh, three centimeters. Um, so these are just uh, this is CT Adam pelvis of the case. The arrow sign showing uh, intraglomerular filling defect within the inferior IVC, which extends inferiorly. Um, to the uh, left common iliac vein, as well as the right common iliac vein. The image uh, for that was not just really included on this, but that's just the imaging findings of the case. Um, so the patient was admitted to the inpatient floor of the temple to receive four units of packed red blood cells, had uh, appropriate response to her hemoglobin uh, coming up to 8.1, which was her pre-procedural hemoglobin. She was also seen by OB, which, which recommended a pelvic ultrasound and uh, kind of working her up for uh, a, uh, a malignancy just because of a large IVC uh, clot burden. Um, she did have an endometrial biopsy done during admission, was found to be negative. She also was seen by a hematology, um, which felt that the IVC or the cable thrombus may be likely secondary compression from her uh, for Lyme myosis uterus or uh, from questionable May Turner seen on uh, CT. Um, also, they were concerned about malignancy as well, but that was ruled out further on. At that time, uh, IR was consulted, um, kind of talking with, uh, looking at the notes and um, everything in that regard, it was found that she did have a relative contraindication of both lysis as well as anticoagulation due to the fact that she did come in with a human 4.1, had questionable dark schools. She wasn't seen by GI, um, but that did kind of raise, um, raise concern for the procedure. Um, there was also a risk for PE due to the free-flowing nature of the cable thrombus. Uh, and due to her age and uh, really didn't have many comorbidities, it was, it was a decision to proceed with a mechanical thrombectomy with a temporary super renal IVC filter because um, it's just such, such large, large clot burden uh, kind of predisposed the risk for a saddle PE in that case. Um, so the access um, and the procedure itself. So the left compound vein was accessed with a micropuncture kit. This was upsized to 035 system. Uh, and after which a long aplats wire is advanced from the left common femoral vein access to the right jugular vein. Um, so for the temporary IVC filter portion of this procedure, a uh, NRA flow shooter kit was used um, and the self-expanding nitinol mesh discs were deployed super renally past the uh, clot to be used as a temporary filter. And that was done through that left common femoral vein access. Following that, the right common femoral vein was accessed in the in the same manner and a long aplat wire was advanced into the right combo vein. So there was a dual, dual wires within the IVC for this procedure. Um, here I have a DSA or a, or a venogram DSV of the, of the right common vein. You see an intraluminal um, filling defect on the IVC extending into the right common iliac vein there. Um, also have a venogram of the left access here. We again see that intraluminal filling defect as well as a filling defect opposing the wall of the left common iliac vein here. Um, so here we have a still picture of uh, the NRE a night all disc kind of projecting at the T12 vertebral body in the IVC with the other um, implants wire with the dual uh, wires within the IVC. So that was the temporary uh, IVC filter utilized for the case here just because of that large clot visualized on CT. Um, so the procedure itself, so a 60 French uh, NRA clot retriever uh, system was used. Um, it was advanced over the wire in the left uh, common femoral vein access, 
after uh, now it's pushed put past the um, the clot itself. Um, after that, the uh, inner catheter was advanced um, past uh, past the nitinol disc. After which the uh, nitinol collection bag and the coring system was uh, more distal or more uh, further away from the clot. After which the um, the collection bag was retracted inferiorly to the common femoral vein sheath. Um, a total of four passes were done. Um, here is the, we don't have a, a venogram or a, or a cine clip of the image of the clot of the uh, procedure itself, but you see here this nanol collection bag from the DNRE uh, flow retriever here, um, as well as the coring element here. Um, this is all more distal to the clot, and you see the, the temporary IVC filter here. Um, so that was done four times after which, so this is uh, actually the still of before. So we see this intraluminal filling defect, and this is the um, this is after the four passes done on the left side. So we see minimal resolution of that uh, filling defect within the IVC here. So following that, the uh, left comfortable vein access was up to, upside to a 16 French um, system as well as, and the uh, NRI uh, clot retriever was, um, was advanced over the wire, retracted uh, towards the sheath in a, a similar fashion, as well as uh, four passes were done at this time. So here we have the pre-procedure. We do see that um, intramural filling defect within the uh, common iliac vein here, and this is the V-gram post-procedurally. So we see uh, interval resolution of both the clot and the IVC, as well as both uh, common iliac veins here. Um, so uh, this is a first procedure, um, 24 hour, done 24 hours after the procedure, we do see um, really just resolution of that intraluminal um, filling defect within the IVC. So the patient um, actually really just uh, did well after the procedure. She uh, sadly did leave um, uh, AMA um, 30 hours post-procedure. She didn't have any complications other than a small right femoral hematoma, which wasn't causing her any pain. Um, she was seen by a hemog during that time. They recommended, um, she was actually like anticoagulation on heparin throughout the procedure, but they uh, they recommended uh, oral anticoagulation to be started at that time. She refused from looking at the uh, list, but she was seen by OB and just due to her heavy menses and her low hemoglobin when she came in, she was given Depo-Provera for that. Uh, I'm looking at the chart even upwards to today, uh, right before kind of the case presentation. She has been presented to Temple um, and I, I hope she's doing fine, but that's, um, that's the case I, I have here. Um, and that was done by uh, Dr. Pratik Patel, who's actually, I, I see him on. All right, thanks. Um, I don't see any any questions uh, that have come in. Um, great job, thanks, Will. Um, the, the um, All right, so the next case that we're gonna have is uh, Joe. Uh, Joe Moran from from Einstein. Joe, again, you should be able to to share your your slides whenever you're ready to go. Yes, let me get it shared. Okay, can you see my screen? Hello. Um, I can't. Um. Yeah, it looks like you have the capability. How about now? Uh, no, I'm still seeing all the presenter slides. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Screen share. Okay, here we go. There we go. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, these are great cases. Uh, I'm Joseph Moran. I'm finishing up my PGY by three year at Einstein Radiology, uh, and I'll be presenting a case that was performed in our department earlier this year. Unfortunately, I wasn't on rotation at the time, and this case belongs to Drs. Rakesh Ahuja and Vineet Khanna. And this is a case of transhepatic transbiliary cystic duct stump embolization. So this was a 38-year-old man, status post open cholecystectomy in January of 2021, who returned to the hospital with complaints of worsening right upper quadrant pain, fevers, and chills. And at the time in the EDA, CT of the abdomen and pelvis with contrast was performed, and uh, the finding of a 5.5 centimeter gas and fluid filled collection in the gallbladder fossa was uh, found. And for this, IR was consulted for percutaneous drainage. And on that CT, we have a single axial slice demonstrating the gas and fluid filled collection in the gallbladder fossa, which was concerning for abscess. 
And on the right, we have uh, the image of the drain placement with injection of contrast confirming the location. And at the time, 30 cc's of pus uh, were drained immediately. So he continued to have a bilious uh, output from his subhepatic drainage catheter. And approximately 400 to 500 cc's were uh, out of that catheter daily. Um, ERCP stenting was not feasible because he'd previously had a ruin y gastric bypass. And so percutaneous drain hepatic biliary drain was performed. And on this uh, cynic lid, you can see that we're doing uh, injection of contrast into the subhepatic collection with backfilling of the biliary tree. And so on the second image, that's the final image from the procedure demonstrating both the subhepatic uh, uh, collection drain as well as the transhepatic biliary drain. So uh, one week after that procedure, the PTBD was capped and the patient continued to have a large amount of output from his subhepatic drain up to a thousand milliliters daily for a week. And significant biliary drainage such as this can result in malnourishment and you can have a long protracted course of healing. And especially with that degree of uh, drainage, you can have severe suffering, morbidity and malnourishment. So a multidisciplinary meeting was held and embolization of the biliary leak was offered. So in the uh, upper right image, we see uh, access through the percutaneous transhepatic biliary drain. Um, and then in the bottom right image, you can see passing the uh, wire into the cystic duct stump. So um, for the procedure, an 035 guide wire was advanced through the biliary drain and the drain was removed. An eight French vascular sheath was placed a pullback cholangiogram was performed and this showed leakage from the cystic duct stump. An 035 Amplatz guide wire was placed abutting the guide wire into the duodenum through the sheath. And then a five French catheter was then advanced through the vascular sheath and used to cannulate the origin of the cystic duct. Then a 2.8 French microcatheter and microwire combination was advanced through the five French catheter and used to cannulate the cystic duct. Iodinated contrast was injected through the microcatheter to confirm position and cystic duct embolization was then performed using a one-to-one -one mixture of NBCA and lipiodol under fluoroscopic guidance. And on this left image, you can see after the placement of that uh, glue embolization. Um, on the second image, there was concern for possible filling defects within the CBD, as you can see uh, outlined by these arrows, which was concern for possible uh, NBCA within the CBD. And so a Fogarty catheter was advanced over the implant's guide wire and the balloon was inflated within the CBD and the balloon was advanced down the CBD into the duodenum three times. And a repeat cholangiogram after this maneuver showed no residual filling defect within the CBD and no extravasation of contrast through the cystic duct stump. The vascular sheath was then removed over the implant's guide wire. The tract was dilated to 12 French and a 12 French internal external drain was advanced over the wire. The catheter was looped within the duodenum under fluoroscopic guidance. The proximal side holes were positioned into the right intrahepatic bil uh, biliary duct and a repeat cholangiogram through the catheter uh, demonstrated no leak and the catheter was found to be in good position. So uh, cystic duct stump leak is a rare complication of cholecystectomy and management with a drain can take weeks for the leak to heal spontaneously in a case such as this where there was large volume of output, output can result in significant morbidity, suffering, and malnourishment. And embolization in this case was performed with a one-to-one -one mixture of NBCA and lipiodol. And uh, percutaneous glue embolization reduces morbidity and mortality versus open uh, exploration, which would be another uh, alternative treatment in a case such as this. So uh, the day after the procedure, the PTBD was capped and the patient was discharged on day three. Uh, 10 days later, he returned with no output from his subhepatic drain and injection into the PTBD showed no leak. The subhepatic drain was removed at that time. Finally, two weeks following, uh, a pullback cholangiogram was performed and there was free, free flow of contrast into the CBD and no contrast leak was identified. So his PTBD was removed. And so there was successful resolution of symptoms after glue embolization and no catheter dependency. Thank you. Um, again, that's another really good case. Uh, thanks, Joe. Um, was there uh, the one to one ratio? Was that basically that you just wanted to put in as little volume as possible? I'm assuming. Uh, I wish I could 
speak to that. Um, I, I, I was not pre present at the time of the uh, case, um, but I would, I would love to talk to uh, Rakesh and Vineet about their, their reasoning for using the one-to-one -one ratio. Okay. Um, okay. All right. Um, again, um, great case. Um, our last uh, presentation um, is going to be uh, from, from Zach. Um, Zach, you should be able to, uh, I think you had both of your um, identities kind of uh, promoted, so you should be good to go. Uh, just for everybody else, so I'm going to, a few minutes after uh, he starts, I'm going to launch the poll. Um, so uh, everybody uh, go ahead and, and vote. Um, just as a reminder, um, you know, we're, we're rewarding everybody that's presenting, but for the top three, um, they're kind of getting a little bit, uh, um, a little bit more greens. So, um, top, top pick will be a $500 gift card followed by 250 and a hundred for third. Um, so no pressure, Zach. So with that, um, floor is yours, Zach. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you. All right, great. We can see your slides as well. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so my name is Zaki Naveed. I'm a, a PGY5 resident at Einstein Medical Center. Um, uh, so the case I'll be presenting is of a 41-year-old male with a known history of metastatic non-small cell ca lung cancer, stage four, diagnosed at an outside hospital a year ago. He was presenting with worsening and progressive shortness of breath, face and neck swelling for six days. Um, in the past, he had received um, three sessions of chemotherapy, but unfortunately due to the COVID-19 pandemic, he had stopped following with his oncology and palliative care due to some communication issues. He was not hospice at that time. Um, of note, um, he was functionally uh, independent and um, he had a uh, 15 pack per day year history of tobacco use. Um, his vitals were um, only significant for tachycardia to the 120s, um, otherwise uh, unremarkable. Um, physical exam, he was cachectic, um, intermittently uncomfortable. Um, he had facial and neck swelling, uh, prominent bilateral external jugular veins. Um, he also had uh, distended chest wall veins extending to the mid-abdomen. Um, his, his abdomen was otherwise soft and a cup of Medusa was noted. Um, labs were only significant for positive COVID tests, otherwise uh, pretty much unremarkable. Um, EKG showed uh, sinus tachycardia. Um, he uh, underwent a CTPE in the ER as most patients do. Um, so this is... Uh, CAT scan showing extensive collaterals. So we can see multiple collaterals in the chest, uh, mediastinum. And then there's this expansive occlusive thrombus in the brachiocephalic uh, going into the SVC. Um, and then this is a coronal image showing again, extensive collaterals. And then he has that expansive thrombus um, in his SVC, brachiocephalic. And then there's also some contrast surrounding the distal aspect of the thrombus in the SVC um, concerning four flea floating thrombus. So IR was consulted, we, recommend, we ordered a lower extremity venous Doppler. We were concerned about tumor versus bland thrombus um, causing SVC syndrome um, given his COVID positive status and history of lung cancer. Um, so various endovascular treatment options were considered for recanalization, um, catheter-directed thrombolysis um, overnight, rheolytic thrombectomy using angiojet, and then suction thrombectomy using angiovac or the Inari uh, flow retriever. Um, the plan was to send the thrombectomy specimen uh, to pathology for analysis. So his uh, venous Doppler lower extremity came back negative for any DVTs. So we, the following day, proceeded for a central recanalization. Um, we obtained bilateral brachial and right common femoral or, uh, vein access. Um, we put in a 22 gauge board dry seal sheath into the right brachial access, a nine French sheath into the left brachial access, and a 12 French sheath um, in the right common femoral vein access. Um, um, the, the, the need for the common femoral vein axis was um, 
to get better stability through the um, a right brachial access as we, we're going to use the Trever device through the uh, right brachiocephalic vein, um, and also to deploy um, a disc at the caveatral junction as a embolic protection device. So this is a central venogram from the right uh, brachial vein, which shows again um, uh, extensive thrombus throughout the SVC um, going into the brachiocephalic and uh, at the confluence with the subclavian. Um, we see a similar thing <clears throat> on the left side um, where um, contrast only uh, pacifies up to the brachiocephalic uh, and uh, subclavian uh, confluence. And like we see collaterals on both sides. So we crossed uh, both occlusions um, using a comfy catheter glide wire. And then we passed a loop snare through a right common femoral vein approach and um, got through and through access with the right biggest phallic vein, um, again, for better stability. And then this is just a uh, venogram from both brachial axes, showing the extent of occlusion. And then we see collaterals, including a, uh, a prominent azygous vein. Um, so um, we proceeded to deploy a flow retriever XL disc um, from the right common femoral vein access and parked it at the um, caveoatrial junction um, to prevent um, non-target embolization. Um, we perform multiple passes with the Trever uh, 20. Um, and uh, this was followed by balloon venoplasty using a 10 by 80 millimeter balloon. Um, after the um, passes with the suction thrombectomy device, we did a, a, a venogram through the right access, um, which showed partial recanalization of the uh, brachiocephalic and SVC. Um, we see uh, some clot above the distal protection device. Um, so we, we bought in the Trever 20 and then performed suction thrombectomy and aspirated that clot, and the, that clot was sent to pathology for analysis. Um, after this, we proceeded to use the FT2 flow retriever disc. Um, we deployed that um, into the superior vena cava and uh, the coring device, and then we performed mechanical thrombectomy. And then this was uh, followed by venoplasty um, along both brachiocephalic veins going into the SVC using 10 by 80 millimeter balloons. Um, we performed a venogram post um, intervention, and then we saw uh, improved flow through both brachiocephalic veins going into the SVC, but there was still um, stenosis present. And so um, we use an intravascular ultrasound at this point to, to make sure that everything is intraluminal rather than some sort of extrinsic compression. And then you can see that there's predominantly acute with subacute clot throughout the uh, brachiocephalic vein and SVC. And then we also used the IVIS to um, uh, help in stent sizing. Um, so we proceeded to um, place double uh, uh, barrel stents. Uh, we used 14 millimeter nitinol bare metal stents, and then we deployed them both into the brachiocephalic vein, extending to the superior vena cava. We used similar uh, size balloons to uh, expand the stents. And this is the final run, which um, shows markedly improved flow um, throughout the bilateral brachiocephalic veins going into the SVC. Um, and we don't see any collateral circulation at this point. So this is the final comparison. This is the pre and post uh, intervention. Um, the patient's post-procedural course was uh, Overall, unremarkable. He had mild tachycardia, which was resolved with normal same boluses and pain medication. Um, palliative care saw him, and he was eventually made DNR DNI, um, and he was agreeable to hospice. Um, he was transitioned from a heparin drip to Lovenox. Um, and then after four weeks, um, we asked him to follow up with us so we could switch him to Eliquis. Um, um, he, at the time, said that he would only follow up if he had any issues. Um, he was discharged in stable condition. Unfortunately, he did not follow up as an outpatient. 
Um, pathology came back positive for um, thrombus containing fragments of non-small cell carcinoma. And this is the clot. Um, uh, this is the coring device. And this is the, uh, this that we use for uh, uh, the embolic protection. Um, so in conclusion, for flow tree versus suction thrombectomy is a viable and feasible option uh, through an upper extremity approach for central recanalization. Um, flow retriever disc can be used um, for temporary cable embolic protection. Um, okay, that's it for me. Um, um, I want to thank the, the attendings who helped me prepare this, especially uh, Vineet Khanna and also uh, Bala, Mike Farah, and uh, Rocky. Okay. Um, thanks. Thanks a lot. That's again another great case. Um,